war. Remember, QE was supposed to be a one-off, uh, one-time emergency measure. And what do we see now? That's just one of the, quote, tools in their toolbox. <laughs> and now they're talking about, in 2020, the Fed coming out, and they've already said in their minutes that, yeah, well, the last time we did QE, we bought a limited amount of assets, and we only bought a couple of billion, a couple of trillion. We probably could have bought more. There wasn't really that much of a problem. So we're looking next time, if there is an issue, like we might have a recession, we can't let that happen, we need to be able to buy more uh, assets, and we need to be able to buy a greater type of asset, meaning we can't just buy mortgage-backed securities and U.S. treasuries. We might have to buy stocks, bonds. Remember, the ECB buys corporate bonds. The Japanese government buys, the Bank of Japan buys, owns 60% of that country's ETFs. That's what the Fed's looking to do. All central banks think that's okay. SDBullion.com is a high-volume physical gold, silver, and precious metal dealer. We are committed to being your trusted source for low-cost, highest quality, investment-grade bullion products. Visit sdbullion.com for more information. All right, welcome back to another Silver Doctors exclusive interview. Today, I'm excited to have returning guest, Mr. Louis Camersano, the creator of Smuggled. And so today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the economy, where we're going, where we're heading, and all those things. So, Mr. Lewis, welcome back to Silver Doctors. Oh, thanks for having me back, Mike. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. Excited uh, for a new year. A lot of things are going on right now, a lot of things good and bad. Uh, what's Lewis keeping an eye on? What concerns you? What excites you? Where are you currently at right now? Well, I'm looking at the gold and silver, and I've long maintained that for a silver bull market to take hold, one of two things has to happen either has to be an increased demand in commodity use, meaning solar panels or elect electrical appliances, or the dormant monetary investment component of silver has to catch fire. And in order for that to happen, I contend that gold has to get into a sustained bull market. And we started to see that last year, Mike, when gold finally broke above 1375 after trying for a number of years to break through that. Well, in mid-2019, last year, we broke above 1375, 1400, 1500, 1550. And gold right now, even today, after we've had a bit of a pullback from the spike that we had from the US-Iranian tensions, is at a seven, eight year high. Now, silver in contrast is still languishing below $20. It hit its recent high in 2016 and during the Brexit mania of about $20.50. So what I'm looking at in 2020, not so much as to what happens between China and the United States and Iran and the United States, geopolitical stuff will always factor into the pricing of commodities, but I think that's short-term trading noise. I think the big key for 2020 for gold and silver is the continuation of something that doesn't have a resolution. You can resolve tensions between Iran and the US or they can elevate and you can resolve trade tensions and get a trade deal with China. If you're gonna trade gold and silver on that, that's a trade. That's not, a, that's not what's driving the price long-term. What's driving the price of gold primarily right now is the idea that central banks, not just Russia and China and Kazakhstan, but a horde of them now are adding to their gold positions. You're seeing gold ETF positions increasing. You're seeing gold demand around the world increasing because of low and negative interest rates. You've got 28% of global bonds yielding negative. You've got massive debt issues in the ECB, the Bank of England, People's Bank of China, the United States. None of those issues are being solved. And in fact, we're going in the other direction, Mike. We have now the Fed, and this is really what drove the gold price in mid 2000 and 19 was the reversal from going from potentially two interest rate hikes in 2019 to actually having three interest rate cuts. So now all central banks are in, at a minimum, a neutral or a um, easing phase. You've got the ECB at negative, you've got all the central banks printing, Bank of Japan, and you now have the Fed doing this not QE repo. Yeah. And all of that liquidity, is leading to the point where the argument against gold has always been, well, it doesn't pay interest. Well, neither do 30% of bonds. 
and you could lose your money there, whereas gold is not going to go anywhere. So in short, what I'm looking at is for a sustained gold bull market based on those fundamentals, not on what might happen in Iran or China. And then once gold hits that 1600 mark and shows that sustainability in the bull market, then I think silver catches fire because there is that smaller component of silver's investment profile, which is 70% industrial and commodity, but that investment part catches fire because it's such a small market. We've seen this in 1979, 1980, in 2009, 2010, 2011, where gold takes off and then finally silver catches fire, surpasses gold on the upside, but then ultimately, unfortunately, spikes and then dives. So I'm not quite sure we're going to get that. This is a better bull market, I think, so far, because it's not happening as fast. And I think you might not see that blow off top if silver eventually catches fire. But right now, silver is not even near $20. And that's a good sign if, you're, if you want to pick up silver now, because if gold, I believe, continues to rise, then silver eventually catches on as the cheaper cousin or the, the little brother, little sister to, to gold. All right. So let me ask you a question. So you're saying, so go, you're anticipating gold at, at around 1600 or so. If it sustains that or rises above that, then that's a good sign, bullish sign for gold. And so assuming you meant, you, I think you threw out the word 20, the 20, $20 there. So silver, if silver catches fire in the way that you're describing, what round, what number do you consider fire? And then where, to, where then, then where could it go off from there okay, in comparison so, to gold? Right. So if you look at what gold did in, to, uh, 2008 to 2011 it essentially went well from 2000 to 2008 went from like 300 dollars to 800 dollars but then it went from 800 dollars to 1900 dollars mm -hmm. and silver went from like eight or nine dollars all the way up to 50 i think you'll see a similar drop in the gold silver ratio i've been saying for five years that the gold silver ratio was sustainable at these 80 and 90 levels because there was no reason for silver to be rising because the the bulk of silver's demand is in commodities and the demand for solar and electronics was actually down over the past five, 10 years. And the, the uh, supply of silver wasn't really dramatically falling off. So that was a pretty much a stable environment. And then we had the drop off in investment silver demand from the peak in silver eagles and those types of products, Indian silver demand in, in 2015, we saw 60% decline, whereas gold, always held, you know, it was holding on in that $1,200, $1,300 range. And I think what has to happen is gold has to seriously look like this is it. It's definitely caught on to the fact that you got negative interest rates, prolific amount of debt being uh, incurred around the world. And that makes it very attractive for gold. And then to a lesser extent, it makes it attractive for silver, but silver doesn't need as much of a boost mm -hmm. as gold. And I think that boost is going to come. So if to put numbers on it, I think if gold gets to 1750, then silver will definitely start to move faster than gold. And that's when you'll see the gold silver ratio go down. It went up the last seven or eight years because silver actually was going sideways and down and gold was steadily building. Now gold is broken out. Once it got past the 1375, it has broken out. It broke all the way up to, I think, what was it, 1620 the other night when there was the initial reports that the Iranians had launched a counter strike. Now we didn't know the extent of the counter strike. But that seemed like, well, here we go. Here's World War III. But you could see how things quickly dissipated in the price when, if, when the, the de-escalated the tensions. I, wouldn't, I would only trade, and I don't trade uh, gold and silver on, on those types of things. In fact, it's generally a good thing to, to sell off on those types mm -hmm. of things because they generally fizzle out. But the fundamentals are, are what I would be looking at, not the um, geopolitical intentions between different countries. Yeah. Now, as you're speaking, I actually have a graph in front of me now. And so it looks like on April 25th, 2011, the gold to silver ratio was 32. Mm -hmm. And so as of now, today, it is about 85, 86. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, a big difference over the last, what looks like nine years. So I'm so based on what you're saying that this next rally, this next, you know, silver skyrocket, we're going to see around at 32 or probably even lower, perhaps, huh? It depends. The lot has changed. The, the last, see, the, since 1974, the gold silver ratio only once was anywhere near 16, and that was 1980, and it was there for a couple of days. The general gold silver ratio since 1974 has been in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we've only seen those two spikes in silver where the gold silver ratio got down that far. 
The difference today, though, is I'm not sure how much money is still going to go into silver. I'm a little, I would have thought when it hit 1500, we would clearly be above 20 in silver. I'm a little concerned that silver hasn't moved yet, but it's still within my thesis that gold has to be in a sustained bull market. And one could argue the bull market in gold really started when it cracked through 1375, and that was over the summer. So we're really only six or seven months into what I think is going to be a sustained bull market. So we'll have to keep an eye on it. If, if gold gets to 1750 and silver is still plunking around at uh, less than $20, then something has changed and silver doesn't have the same monetary uh, allure that gold might have. And that is clear. That's one of the reasons that uh, I always say gold has to go first because gold is what's still held and, and coveted by wealthy individuals, institutions, and central banks, whereas silver has always been the poor man's metal. And there's not a monetary component there like there is for, for gold. But we did see in 2008, I mean, that's pretty much the modern era, that silver did manage to rise higher. The, the problem with silver is it's easily manipulated on the downside. We've seen the smash downs take less effort on the COMEX than they do for gold because gold is more global. You've got a, a much um, larger it's a larger market because you've, you've, central banks are involved in it. You've got the LBMA, you've got much uh, more gold trading and you also have gold jewelry is also a big component of gold demand. And a lot of that gold jewelry is investment. Now that's the counter side to that is that gold jewelry, the more expensive gold gets, you start to lose some physical demand on jewelry because you can put off jewelry purchases. Mm -hmm. The upside to silver though, Mike is we saw in the last bull market in silver when silver hit $50, it had no impact whatsoever on industrial manufacturers uh, buying silver at that price, which means the demand stays the same. And what happens, and the reason the price rises, is that there's still the constant demand for silver for industrial purposes, but now there's this additional demand as a monetary safe haven. That's really what pushes the price of silver higher because you're competing with a fixed pool that isn't going anywhere. The, the electronic manufacturers are still going to buy silver, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 dollars an ounce. Yeah, good point. Now, you're, we're, you're talking about price. And so everything we're referring to happens to be about uh, the United States dollar, uh, the price on it uh, of metals here, but yet all around the world, uh, pretty much in uh, majority of the countries on this planet, gold and silver, gold especially, has already reached an all time high, surpassing yeah. the last bull rally. So what is that really telling us about either, you know, what's going on outside the US or what's being deliberately controlled and press suppressed down here in the U.S. What it tells us is that what a lot of people that follow gold and silver don't understand is that the dollar, as much debt as the U.S. has taken on, and you and I have discussed this, that the, there's clearly issues with the fundamentals of the U.S. economy. It's debt based. You got two hundred trillion dollars unfunded liabilities. You got twenty-two trillion dollar deficit. The Fed's printing. You've got negative. You got low interest rates. You got not QE going on. The difference is that other countries are doing, it's all fiat relative. They're all doing similar things, if not worse things. But the problem for those other countries like China and the ECB and Bank of Japan and all the emerging markets is a lot of their debt is denominated in US dollars, which means there's a demand for the US dollar. Whereas when the US can actually print up that difference, they can do QE, and it doesn't have an impact. So the dollar actually is strong and is, is ironically considered the other safe haven. And that's why gold isn't reaching all-time highs against the dollar, but against all other currencies. It's blown through all the all-time highs in the, in the euro. All, all currencies, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, well past their all-time highs. And that's actually good for gold because eventually gold is a stronger, Greenspan has said, no fiat currency, not even the U.S. dollar, can challenge gold because gold is at a fixed price. It has a longer history. It doesn't, can't go bankrupt. It's clearly a better play than the dollar, except there is more demand for dollars than there is for gold right now. We could say central banks are buying gold, but they're buying tens of billions, hundreds of billions. But the amount of dollars that is required to meet the trillions of dollars worth of debt obligations denominated in U.S. dollars gives the dollar a demand that you don't see in other currencies. There is no demand. There's not yuan denominated debt to the levels that there are. So there's not that much demand for the yuan. So the yuan can go down. The 
the ruble can go down, the euro can go down versus gold because those currencies aren't held in reserve. They're not, they don't have a lot of the debt that has to be repaid in those currencies. And that's why you're seeing gold destroying those currencies and do dollars holding up. I mean, if you think about it, 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 the dollar really is very strong right now versus all the fiat currencies and relatively against gold. Now, unfortunately for silver, if you had invested the last 10 years in gold in any of those currencies, you're way up. But in silver, it's been hit or miss the past five years. In some currencies, even the Indian rupee, you might have been down in rupee terms versus silver. And that's where silver really has a lot of upside if, again, it catches that monetary bid, that dormant uh, investment uh, quality that, that silver has historically, then silver has a lot of catching up to do. And like you say, it could go from 90 to 1 gold-silver ratio back down, provided silver catches that bid again. Now, it probably will take longer than we expect, just like in the last, you know, silver, it takes a while. But the problem, if you look at the silver charts, when silver catches on, it just spikes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those two charts, I have in front of me, the 79.80 spike and the 2010-2011 spike, they were over within months. Yeah. Now, one thing that I'm curious to find out your thoughts on is the fact that based upon my, you know, a little bit of knowledge, I, I've been following the monetary financial situation for, you know, close to a decade now. And so prior to... Great channel you have there on that. Well, thank you. So I appreciate it. It's, 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 it's a labor of love, you know, trying to awaken people. But yet also a lot of people are saying that, hey, the dollar will always be around. It's going to always be this, this, that, that. I'm like, OK, well, I, I don't believe that. So I don't we'll, believe we'll find that. out. <laughs> we will find out. And so based upon prior experiences with the with when there's times of war, uh, typically, I think the markets tend to respond negatively, but yet for some reason, the Dow Jones has reached an all-time high at a time where we were supposed to be at war, but we're not at war, as well as the whole political charades of impeachment and you name it. And so what, what are your thoughts? What are your assessment on this re current reality that we're experiencing? What's going on? Okay. So the reason stocks are higher, especially U.S. stocks, is it's it's a, it's a function of you can't get a return anywhere else. This is something plaguing retirees. Uh, if you look at a model portfolio for retirees, it used to be you'd be a lot in cash, a lot in bonds. You might have a smattering of stocks, blue chip stocks, but you were looking to batten down the hatches and get interest income. Well, there is no place to get interest income now. And so we have a situation where I believe that the United States views the dollar and its stock market as two primary strategic geopolitical tools. And that's why you don't, like you saw at the end of 2018 when the stock market fell, the plunge protection team got together and then what happened in 2019? Stocks were up 35%. Now, did stocks grow 35%? Did earnings grow 35%? No. What happened was money was pumped into the equity markets and you get a willing market participant because where else are they going to put their money? Yeah, they can buy gold and silver. Most people don't know about that. And in fact, if you look at most pension funds, any talk to people who work for companies, they don't offer those types of funds anyway. So you basically have an opportunity for your 401ks that Trump's always talking about. I think he called 409s. <laughs> 409Ks. Um, he deleted that tweet. But that you don't have options and your options are basically to buy equities. So it becomes not so much based on fundamentals that stocks are going up, but based on just demand. It's the same with the dollar. The dollar doesn't have good fundamentals. Dollars are very weak fundamentals. But as I mentioned earlier, they ha it's, there's tremendous demand for the dollar. That's hard for people to understand because they go, oh, the dollar's worth this, the dollar's toilet paper, they got all this stuff. Yeah, it does. But the world runs on it and they borrow in dollars. So there's a demand for it irrespective of the fundamentals of the dollar. And then when you compare those US dollar fundamentals to the ECB, the Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China, it's superior because why? The US has pays, the Fed pays interest. ECB is a negative, the Bank of Japan is a negative. That's why the dollar is strong as it is when its fundamentals are horrible. It's only because its fundamentals are horrible, but relative to the other fiat currencies, it's far superior and there's demand for it. That doesn't make any sense, but that's the reality of the situation. However, that can't last forever. Yeah. That, that the number one the currency in the world is the one that has the most demand, even though it has very flawed fundamentals. Mm, interesting. Now, one thing uh, I'm concerned about, and so I, I talk a lot about 
uh, the fact that there will be a day the, where the world enters, or not the world, but the U.S. Enter to, enters into an official recession. And by the time it's announced and it's official, that means we've probably already been in something that's been very problematic. And so will we see a quote-unquote recession officially this year, or will we just hear, experience the tremors leading up until the big day of reckoning where there will be officially announced? Will it all be a gradual or are we in recession now? Or what are your thoughts on recession 2020? The problem with, with judging a recession is they keep changing what they include in GDP. We've probably been in a recession for the last six years, but the way they measure it, there's like this positive growth. And the way they talk about a recession is you have to have two negative quarters of GDP growth, or meaning you have negative GDP growth for two quarters. They've managed, and this is all financial engineering, this never happens in the business cycle. I think for 11 years, we haven't had a recession, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, so I don't think we're going to have a recession the way they measure it. And the only reason I say that is they can just pump money into the system. Also, when the stock market rises, there's a direct correlation. There's some GDP basis points you pick up when the stock market rises. Mm -hmm. So they can engineer a GDP number so you don't have a recession ever. That doesn't mean you don't have economic declines. You don't have real recessions. It just means that they managed to paper it over. But the problem is with that is the perception is the reality. And if people think they're not in a recession, then there's not a recession. They can print their way out of a recession the way they measure it. Not that they can print their way out. They have not created real growth. Mm -hmm. We have not had dynamic growth the last 10 years. What they've done is avoided wide scale economic displacement. But they haven't created this growth that they're claiming they're creating. But the way they measure it, they've created it. And that's how traders trade. They trade on the basis of, the, the they all accept this gospel this is this is the lay of the land we're not in recession no. so i think there won't be a recession the way they measure it but that doesn't mean i think that the economy is going to is going to do well or it's not going to go down i just think they'll be able to to paper it over because they have unlimited ability to print money look at this not qe stuff i, yeah. I mean it's 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 <laughs> is it a trillion yet is like 600 billion i mean they just it doesn't seem to phase them whatsoever. And that's just what we're being told. So we don't exactly. actually know the actual numbers behind the scenes. So we're being told a certain amount of billions per day, but who knows? And, and actually, why do they have to do that? Because they already set up an artificial system where they think that interest rates need to be a certain amount. They can't allow the market to dictate them because we saw if the market dictated them, overnight rates would be 10% because the banks don't have that kind of money to lend. But in order for the system to work, they have to lend at lower rates and the, those overnight rate rates have to be low. So the Fed just puts the money in there. But that's the same thing with the stock market. That's the same thing with all of our prices. They're all manipulated by a Fed that has gotten over the last 10 years and, and the ECB and the Bank of Japan far, far more interventionist than they ever, ever were. Remember, QE was supposed to be a one-off, uh, one-time emergency measure. And what do we see now? That's just one of the, quote, tools in their toolbox. <laughs> and now they're talking about in 2020, the Fed coming out, and they've already said in their minutes that, yeah, well, the last time we did QE, we bought a limited amount of assets, and we only bought a couple of billion, a couple of trillion. We probably could have bought more. There wasn't really that much of a problem. So we're looking next time, if there is an issue, like we might have a recession, we can't let that happen. We need to be able to buy more uh, assets, and we need to be able to buy a greater type of asset, meaning we can't just buy mortgage-backed securities and U.S. treasuries. We might have to buy stocks, bonds. Remember, the ECB buys corporate bonds. The Japanese government buys, the Bank of Japan buys, owns 60% of that country's ETFs. That's what the Fed's looking to do. All central banks think that's okay. Yeah. And that's how you avoid a recession. Now, that's not really how you avoid a recession. That's how you paper it over. But that's the, what they're thinking and these things have become norm negative interest rates, not just occasionally, but like 29% of bonds, 30% of bonds don't pay a rate of interest. That's not normal. That's all a function of um, financial engineering. We never would have thought possible. They used the 2008 crisis to grab all this power and to make it seem normal that they could just print money and buy. So you got Yang out there running for president saying, we'll just give everybody $1,000 a month. Yeah, okay. as if that's gonna really help. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts. And so we are uh, next week. Next week, uh, President Trump has been very active in saying that there's going to be a trade deal signed 
that's how I, mm-hmm. last time I checked, there's supposed to be some type of celebration for the phase one. You know, what, what, what's your assessment on that? Will, will that make a difference in, in the overall health? Will that be able to prolong some things of keeping our narrative of the economy doing great going? Or if it's not signed, will the markets respond negatively or will it reach an even further all-time high based upon the fact that they're going to find a way to make that happen? What are your thoughts? Well, I think that for gold and silver, that's already been priced in and we saw – for months, there's going to be a deal. There's not going to be a deal. And that would move gold up and down. I think the gold market doesn't care about that anymore. Now, as to the economy, that would be a perception of a boost to the economy. And of course, they would want to get that reaction out of it in the stock market. Mm-hmm. And there may be, I haven't looked at the, the details of the deal, but if there is indeed what Trump is talking about, additional um, exports that the U.S. could make and farming and so on, that would boost. That would be a real boost. Because one of the cuts against the U.S. economy is that it's a service economy. It doesn't produce anything. And uh, other than the very largest, like, military equipment, um, but the knickknacks and the white goods, like refrigerators and and cars, the U.S. doesn't make as much of as it once did. If part of that agreement includes China buying some mid-level type of product that the United States has declined in, then that would be a boost to the economy, the real economy, not as, but of course they would try to make that translate into uh, triple size stock market gains if they could. So I think actually a deal with China would prolong. They're looking to do anything they can to say everything is fine. And that's something that would have some reality to it rather than just the Fed doing not QE or lowering interest rates. Mm, interesting. So as we move into 2020, we're just intended with the, just within a couple of days of it. Uh, what's your oh, anticipation? 2020. Wait, wait. What, what do you mean? So, wait, wait, wait. so we're a couple of days into 2020. Into it. Oh, I think yes, as I'm we sorry. move into it, we're almost. A couple I'm sorry. Of days. Yeah. So we're okay. already into it. So now, what will we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing there further January, interest rate January, cuts? January 10th. Will we be seeing further interest rate cuts? this next go round, whether it be cuts this year or I've heard some people say that they perhaps might even attempt to try to raise to show that things are really doing well or whatever. What are your thoughts? Will they be cutting as well as making some type of official announcement of QE or do they even need to announce it as QE? No, I think what they want to do is continue this not QE. And then mm-hmm. what they want to do is say everything is fine and we don't need to raise interest rates at all. And mm-hmm. then they'll play it by ear. So what they'll do is they'll make sure that they're pretending not too hot, not too cold. But then if they see the stock market go down or they get a low GDP number, they'll talk about cutting rates, but they won't, might not necessarily cut them. They probably won't raise rates or even talk about raising rates unless somehow this phase one China deal actually provides a real boost to the economy, the way they measure it. Then they might cut rates and try to, they would love to gain credibility by, uh, not cover, to, by raising rates. That's why I said back in 2013, 14, 15, and 16, everyone said they're not going to raise rates. They can't raise rates. I said, now they will. They'll never normalize them. They want to somehow appear that they're prudent. and They're not like all the other central banks that are cutting and doing QE. Now that they've raised rates and now that they've cut them three times, Powell has said he doesn't want to go the negative interest rate rate. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that he wants to be prudent. They're basically signaling they'd rather buy assets Mm-hmm. Assets have a direct impact much more than the interest rate. And, the, and, you know, to keep the U.S. reserve currency and have people say, I want to hold something in reserve, you got to pay a little interest. So if the Fed wants to manipulate the economy, they could just print the money, as Mario Draghi would say, and buy assets. And they could be far more effective because they can direct where they're gonna, the money's going to go. Right now, they're directing it at the repo market. Maybe this summer they have to direct it at, if they get approval, to the stock market or the bond market, whatever area they think the economy needs help. It's far more laser guided to print money and send it somewhere than it is just to lower the the base rate of interest. As we saw, lowering interest rate itself did not stop the repo market from freezing up. They said, oh, rate should be this low. And the market said, no, they shouldn't, 10%. And they said, oh, okay, well, we got to, what they have to do? They had to print the money to fix it. I think the Fed is of the view that interest rate is now a minor tool. They know that they need to print money and put it where they want it to go. Mm, interesting. Well, Louis Camersano, it is always great to connect with you to get your thoughts and analysis on where we're at and where we're going. And so you definitely laid it out for us today. I appreciate you. Uh, for those that might be coming across you for the first time, where can you, where can they find more of your work? Point them in your direction to be a blessing to your work. Oh, thank you, Mike. I'm a uh, smoggle.com and on smoggle.com, I cover this kind of stuff we talked about here. Also some cryptocurrencies, general economics, gold, silver. And then I do a YouTube channel and I have a bit channel and I'm on Twitter and 
to a lesser extent, I post stuff to Facebook and Gab and other places. But the main places are BitChute. Um, I do live stream on YouTube and then smallgold.com and Twitter. Sounds good. Well, once again, Lewis, it's been great hanging out with you and getting your thoughts and analysis. Looking forward to connecting with you in a couple of more weeks or months ahead and see where we're at then and get your thoughts. And so once again, it's been great. Thanks for joining me here on Silver Doctors. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone.